my name is Maurice Cherry. I am from Selma, Alabama. And in 1996, I really was emphatic about HTML and about the web. And I don't know if any of you remember what the web might have looked like back then, but it was pretty bad. It was bad. This is what Apple's website looked like. This is what McDonald's' website looked like. This is Coca-Cola's website in 96. I'm not sure why there's a gavel and a shoe form and pennies at the bottom. And this is what Pepsi's website looked like in 96. What I think is really interesting here is this part at the bottom about if traveling at speeds less than 28.8 a baud per second, then jump on the low road. Websites back then tended to have these kind of high speed and low speed type of lanes or different versions of the site, depending on what your connection speed was, which I think is kind of interesting. But I graduated out of Selma, Alabama, and I ended up coming to Atlanta, going to Morehouse College. Morehouse College is an uh, all-male HBCU located in Atlanta. And I wanted to be like this guy. Uh, this guy that you're seeing on the screen is Dwayne Wayne. He's a character on a NBC sitcom called A Different World, which took place at a fictional HBCU called Hillman College, which actually was based off of both Morehouse College and Spelman College, which are right across the street from each other in Atlanta. But Dwayne Wayne was a tech nerd, basically. He did computer programming. He did math. He ended up working for a software company. And I wanted to be like him, especially because I was learning about HTML. And so I remember going to my advisor and telling him that I wanted to learn HTML. I really wanted to do this as a career. And he told me flat out that the internet is a fad and that if this is something that you really want to do, then you should probably think about changing your major. And so I changed my major over to math, which is what I ended up getting my degree in from Morehouse College. I graduated from there in 2003. These are some of the companies here in Atlanta that I have worked for. In 2008, I struck out on my own and started my own design studio called Lunch. Through lunch, I managed to do a number of things such as teach. I've taught at these uh, universities and organizations. These are some of the projects that I'm, I've done over the past, my goodness, 15 or so years, probably more than that, which I will talk about throughout this presentation. These are some of the places that my work has been featured. And uh, Revision Path is probably how most people know me, as uh, Stephen mentioned in the introduction, that's my podcast where I interview Black designers and developers from all over the world. And I've done that now for a little over eight years. We're celebrating episode 400 this week, which is a pretty big milestone. But for me to really talk about Revision Path, which is what folks know me for, I really have to go back to my very first project, my very first big project that I did, which was called the Black Weblog Awards. Now, I started the Black Weblog Awards back in 2004, because back at that time, a lot of people were blogging. It's a little hard to visualize it now, I think, because so many people are on, you know, Twitter and TikTok and their social media types of sites. But before all of those, there were blogs. There was Blogspot. There was Movable Type. There was Text Pattern. There were a number of different types of content management systems. So much so that people actually made award shows for them. And when I looked at these award shows, there were two major ones. There was one called The Weblog Awards, which kind of was shortened to the bloggies. And then there was another one that was called also The Weblog Awards. Branding, not really a strong point here, but you had these two sort of different blog awards. And one thing that I noticed was that there were never really any people of color that seemed to be nominated, particularly not any black bloggers. And I knew a lot of black bloggers. As you can see here on the screen, I took these screenshots from the, from the Internet Archive here. And as you can see, like for Best African or Middle Eastern Weblog, what's interesting is that none of these nominees were African. Like none of them were Black people. And I thought there has to be some kind of event or something to recognize all the Black bloggers that I know about. I was even blogging at the time for a site called Backwash. And so that's when the next year in 2005, I started the Black Weblog Awards, which design's not that great. I'll be the first to admit that. I was teaching myself how to design. Oh, let me go back. Sorry. I was teaching myself how to design based off of a cracked version of Photoshop and whatever information I could glean from 
those like .NET magazines that you would see in Barnes and Noble. I was kind of just picking up any kind of design knowledge that I could, uh, because as I mentioned in my intro, I didn't go to design school. I went to a liberal arts college, I majored in math, and I was doing design stuff on the side. So I really was teaching myself how to do all of this by making these projects to try to find a way to get my skills up. Okay. And so I continued doing the Weblog Awards in 2006 is where it really started to take off. The first year was a bit rocky, but once people learned about it and knew what it was, it started to take off in terms of other people really finding out about it. And so we changed up the design, which would end up being a hallmark of the Black Weblog Awards. I would do a different logo or a different design every year. And so for this particular year, we had introduced a category called best blog design. And these were basically ways for me to shout out people that I knew were doing really great design work. These are other black designers and doing it for other black blogs. And I myself was a designer at the time. At the time I was working, I think I had just left working for the state of Georgia as an electronic media specialist. And I was joining AT&T to start as a junior web designer. And so I was working in the field, doing all this sort of work and knowing other of my peers that were doing this work, but we just weren't getting any sort of recognition for it out of design media as a whole. Back then in 2006, you had AIGA, you had a couple of magazines or online magazines, but none of them really ever featured anything about black designers at all. And it was in 2006 that I wanted to do something around that but I really didn't have the time or the space to make that happen. I was working full time. I was also in graduate school full time at this time. And I just didn't have the space to really make it happen. Fast forward to 2008, I'm working at AT&T and I'm doing just websites like this that you see on the screen. Essentially AT&T was kind of a production shop. And what they did was as the salespeople sold Yellow Pages ads, like the actual physical Yellow Pages, these companies would get a free website. And so there would be often tens of thousands of websites in the queue that needed to be created. And these were websites that often had to be created within a day or less. So we always had a huge backlog of work that needed to be done. And so when you're in a production house, and you have all this work coming at you like a fire hose, you have to figure out a quick way to come up with designs very easily that one, relate to the business, but then also look good. And so I had come up with a design system working at the Yellow Pages where we could easily make these sorts of websites uh, that you see here. And we could swap out graphics, easily swap in text and images and really try to get them out the door. But this type of work was really soul crushing work. It really was like the McDonaldization of design. And I hated it so much, so much in fact that I quit and I started my own studio in November of 2008 called Lunch. And starting with Lunch was interesting because I felt like I could do this better. To keep in mind, I really had only been a professional working designer for about three years. I started professionally in 2005. I quit my job in 2008 but I still had been doing all these projects and things like the Black Weblog Awards to kind of get my skills up and to network. And so I felt like I could do better. So let me start my own studio. And in 2009, uh, this is when I got my first really big client. Uh, and it happened to be a politician in Atlanta. So the mayoral race was going on in Atlanta and we had a number of different candidates that were running. And I managed to attract the attention of, well, I guess before I get to that, I'll show you some of the work that I did through my studio. I did a lot of brand work and identity work. What you see here on the left is some work that I did for the Atlanta Street Food Coalition. This was a nonprofit group that was trying to get food carts on the streets of Atlanta. Also did some logo design work that you see here for the pickle. Also did a lot of email marketing work, as you see here on the right, this is for Nike basketball camps and the U.S. sports camps. But as I mentioned before, I ended up doing some political work. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I can't really see my preview, so I apologize if I'm skipping ahead here a bit. This is also some other types of work that I did, typographic posters, usually based off of quotes. 
now I'll skip to where I was talking about with the actual politicians. There was a politician running for mayor of Atlanta. Her name was Lisa Borders. And uh, I'm going to play this commercial. This is one of the first pieces that I put together for her campaign. You should be able to hear the audio as I play this. No one is more committed to protecting our families from crime than Lisa Borders, who says those who know her record best. 1,100 members of the Atlanta Police Department have endorsed her, saying no other candidate has the ability or experience to be mayor of Atlanta. She made the tough choices. No more furloughs, police walking our neighborhoods, safety in our homes. Atlanta deserves a leader who does more than promise protection. Lisa Borders for mayor of Atlanta. So that was one of the like first video pieces no one that I did working on the campaign. As you can see here, this is a still from the video. One thing that you may notice here, this person in the back here that's wearing red, this is Stacey Abrams. Stacey was Lisa's campaign manager at the time. She was still working uh, for Georgia State government and she was an author. She's a, a romance author that goes by the name Selena Montgomery. But she was the campaign manager on Lisa's campaign. And so I had a chance to know about Stacy and learn about Stacy before she's hit the national stage as she's done now. And here's another still from the video. You can see me right here at the, the kind of like top center. I designed this logo. We had these t-shirts and signs, I think printed by a local uh, printers union overnight. And this is something that we have to really come up with like quickly because for Lisa, she was initially in the race. She dropped out for several months and then jumped right back in the race at the thick of it. So we had to come back with a new logo, new name recognition. And I was on her campaign task to help with making all of that happen. This is the website that I ended up designing for her in 2009. And this was just her campaign website that showed how people could find out more about her, how they could contribute, how they could volunteer, how they could donate and really get behind and support the campaign. One thing to keep in mind as you look at this is that this is 2009. This is the first set of municipal races after Obama won the election, the presidential election in 2008. So every single politician running for some type of office that following year wanted the same sort of Obama-esque like polish for their campaign. They saw how good design worked in politics and they wanted like the exact same thing, oftentimes with the exact same typefaces, as you can see right here, where it says Atlanta City Council votes to end furloughs. That's Gotham, which is the typeface that was used throughout Obama's campaign for his first and second terms. So 2010 happens, the mayoral election happens. Unfortunately, Lisa does not win. She comes in third place. After that, she ends up joining the Grady Health Foundation and becomes their president. And because of the work that I was doing, I ended up becoming basically their go-to design guy. So they became my, one of my biggest clients. And so here's some of the work that I did for the Grady Health Foundation back in 2010. What was interesting with this is that we're building off of not, we're building off a content management system from Blackboard called Net Community. Uh, so it's something that's like completely different from WordPress or Drupal or anything like that, because it ties into a number of different like backend fundraising systems. It was kind of a super difficult implementation overall, but we had this website and then along with that, a number of different, you know, kind of digital and print type of ephemera that went with it, logos, branding for different campaigns. We ended up having a mobile version of the website, as you can see right here on the right. This is one of the big campaigns that we did with the Grady Health Foundation in conjunction with Delta Airlines. Essentially what it was a two week fundraising campaign where for every dollar that you donated to the Grady Health Foundation, you got one Delta Sky Mile. And so I think we ended up raising like over $2.5 million in this two week campaign all through the website, by the way, all of these are digital donations. And it was a really successful campaign that kind of ended up putting my little studio lunch kind of ended up putting it on the map in Atlanta as the studio to work with if you want to make money as a nonprofit. So we ended up getting a lot of client work just from doing this sort of campaign and continuing to work with the Grady Health Foundation. Also in 2010, as I'm still doing the Black Weblog Awards, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, 
I had an opportunity to present at South by Southwest, which is this music, film, and interactive festival that takes place in Austin, Texas. And they have three tracks, music, film, and interactive. Interactive is basically the web. And I presented basically a panel that I called Black Blogging Rock Stars. As you can see here from, I think pretty much everyone on this poster is a Black blogger. Some of these people you may recognize as sort of household names, I think, at this point in the Black community. There's Farai Chade. I think Baratunde Thurston is on here somewhere. Who else is on here that might be notable? The Fury, which was Kid Fury's blog. Kid Fury is one half of the popular podcast, The Read. So like when you see stuff like this, you can know that like Black bloggers have been around for a very long time. And now this was me five, about five to six years in from doing the Black Weblog Awards. And I'm now presenting this panel at South by Southwest called Black Blogging Rockstars, which is about how I built the Black Weblog Awards, what it means to celebrate Black people blogging and, and podcasting and video blogging, doing all of this content creation on the web. And it ended up being a really successful panel. As you can see here from this screenshot, these are the different sort of logos that I ended up using and creating over the years as we did the Black Weblog Awards. The last one that you see here is for 2011, which ended up being the final year of the Black Weblog Awards. And this was a time when I really was getting, actually, I was kind of getting tired of doing the Black Weblog Awards. I had done it by myself largely for all these years. We had some help here and there, but it was getting to a point where I knew that I wanted to do more creative work. And I felt like the Black Weblog Awards was starting to kind of uh, hold me back a little bit. Also in 2011, I turned 30 and I really wanted to have something that was closed the chapter on my 20s as I went into my 30s and tried to decide like what the next thing is that I'm going to do. And so what we did was we created a Kickstarter campaign for the 2011 Black Weblog Awards and we partnered with the National Black Arts Festival to basically do a live ceremony and reception. We were going to rent out, for those of you who might be familiar with Atlanta downtown, we were going to rent out the Rialto Theater downtown. We had talked with a uh, awards provider to create awards and everything. But Kickstarter was really in its infancy back then, and not a lot of people really knew about the concept of online crowdfunding. So while we had a pretty modest goal of about $10,000 for the campaign, I think we got maybe, maybe 8% of that. So back then Kickstarter, and it still is all or nothing, so we didn't get even close to that. And so I was just kind of so tired of doing the awards and wanted to be rid of it that I sold it. And I actually had a lot of buyers for the Black Weblog Awards. Ebony Magazine, most notably, was really interested in buying the Black Weblog Awards. And I was thinking of selling it to them. Ebony Magazine kind of has a bit of history in my family because the founder of Ebony Magazine, of Johnson Publishing Company, John H. Johnson, his wife, Eunice Johnson, is from my hometown, and her and my grandmother were friends growing up. So I knew about the family and, and everything like that, so it was kind of like a family connection. But the leadership at the time at Ebony was not something that I really wanted to sell the awards to. And so I ended up selling them to this woman. And uh, this woman that you see here, her name is Gina McCauley. She's an attorney in Austin, Texas. At the time during the, I would say, mid-2000s to like early 2010s, was a very active and prolific blogger. She had a website called What About Our Daughters? And she also had founded a conference called the Blogging While Brown Conference that she put on every year that had panels and speakers and such. And I felt like it would be good to kind of keep it in that family, because what I saw Gina was doing was really advancing the cause of celebrating Black people online, different than from what Ebony was really doing. Ebony was really more focused on entertainment. And so I sold the awards to Gina, and she has kept it going. She kept it going until 2017. This is what she was kind of able to do in 2011, had a number of, of trophies and things made. As you can see here, these are... I think the guy on the left is Rich Jones, who is a, I think he does a, a pretty popular finance podcast right now. That's Lovey Jones. They're not related, but she's a New York Times bestselling author, podcaster herself. 
right here, this is Renee Seiler. She's an actress. This is a, a Black tech blogger named Brother Tech. And then for those of you who are familiar with the show Living Single, that is Kim Coles who plays uh, Sinclair on that show. And so Gina was really able to take the awards and turn it into something big and like really turned into a destination event. As you can even see here on the, the step and repeat, there's her blogging while Brown logo. And then there's like a makeshift Black Weblog Awards logo because she bought it and turned it around in the same year. <laughs> like I think she bought it in February or March. And then the event was in like May or June. So she really turned it around very quickly and kept it going for a number of years, which really allowed me in 2012 to start thinking of new stuff to do. I still had my studio. I was still working and doing things with lunch. Here's a couple of other projects that we ended up doing. We worked with the Metro Atlanta Association of Professionals, which is a professional, it's the LGBTQ professional organization in Atlanta. This was a logo that we ended up doing for the Mayor's Summer Reading Club in Atlanta, which they still use to this day. Basically, it's a, a reading club from the mayor's office where they talk about different books for kids of different ages, did more email marketing work. This is for one and only the Ocean Club Bahamas, some stuff from Van Heusen. This is a website we did for a nonprofit, Gears. The head of this nonprofit is the wife of Arthur Blank, who is the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. So we're able to kind of do a lot of pretty good nonprofit work. Also through the work that I was still doing with the Grady Health Foundation, the studio really was not hurting for work. But even though I didn't have the Black Weblog Awards, I still kind of had this like tingling feeling of wanting to do some type of project. And now that I have the space to do it in 2013, this sort of brought me back again to what I did in 2006 with the best blog design and thinking, I want to do something that's going to celebrate Black designers and the work that they're doing. And so from that, oh, forget that slide. From that came uh, Revision Path. Uh, this is the initial logo that I ended up doing for Revision Path. And these are some of the screenshots from the very first version of the website. And so what Revision Path was going to be was an online magazine that would interview Black designers and web developers about their work. This is kind of another sort of screenshot in terms of the quote that someone might have said. And uh, as I started doing this, I managed to get some fairly large names pretty early on. Most notably was this guy here, this person you see here. This is Emery Douglas, who is, he was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party and uh, is also currently an AIGA medalist. But I ended up getting in touch with him because I was doing some research on his work and I came across the skateboard shop in Oakland, California. And I saw that they were using his images for their skateboard decks. And I think I had called up the shop and asked them like how they were able to kind of license his work. And it turns out that the guy that answered the phone was his grandson. And so he put me in touch with Emery. We ended up talking one Sunday afternoon. I recorded it using uh, Google Voice. And that ended up becoming the podcast. I think it's episode like 13 or 14, if you want to go look it up. It's like one of our early episodes. But other stuff that I wanted to do through Revision Path was kind of mirror what I saw other similar types of design sites doing. So I wanted to not just have these interviews, but also have some other sort of like fun stuff. So one thing that I wanted to do was a holiday gift guide, which... We do a holiday gift guide now still every year. We made these little shareable graphics for Kwanzaa. Now Kwanzaa's not uh, like this. Kwanzaa's not something that I like fully celebrate and observe, but I do like the idea of having a period of introspection at the end of the year around the set of shared values, which essentially is what I kind of gleaned from the holiday. And so what I wanted to do was take these particular words and then design them in a way that tied them to modern concepts so people could understand them. So for example, Ujama, which uh, is Swahili for collect cooperative economics. This is Oprah, and this is supposed to mimic like the Supreme logo. Kawumba means creativity. This is uh, supposed to mimic Beyonce's self-titled album. This is Nia. This is the year that Nelson Mandela passed away. Nia means purpose. And so we kind of did these sorts of things every year just to kind of draw some more attention to what we were doing with the vision path. One, to show design, but also to 
kind of explicitly show like how black it is to be completely honest when i started doing the black weblog awards and even when i did revision path in the initial stages there was a lot of pushback from people that said that the projects i were doing were like racist because they thought that the world was post-racial because we had nominated the black president we are now past racism why are you doing something that's so explicitly about one race when you could be doing it for every race when the reality of the situation is there are many other outlets that could be doing things for every other race, but they're only showcasing one particular race. So how is what I'm doing so different from that, especially if I'm giving it this love and this attention and this focus and doing so in a positive way, not in a negative way. But anyway, 2014 goes along. Revision Path is still starting to grow. And one project that I create out of Revision Path is a sister site called 28 Days of the Web. And what 28 Days of the Web is a celebration of Black designers and developers for every day in February, like in conjunction with Black History Month. And so this is kind of a screenshot of the website after the first year. And what you'll notice is that it goes woman, man, woman, man, woman, man. So there's 14, 14 men, 14 women, and that's how I split it up for February. And clicking on each one of these will give you a particular profile of that person. So for example, the person that was in the bottom, that's Mina Markham. She's a, a designer and a front-end developer. Uh, right now, she's most notably known for creating the design system for the Hillary for America campaign. She created the design system called Pantsuit. We should check out her episode on the Revision Path where she talks about that. It's pretty good. I also gave the Revision Path website a bit of a makeover. We still kind of keep a similar design like this to this day, actually. But as I did this update in 2014, I really wanted to break it out of that kind of dark map overlay that I had before and do something that was a little more legible and that was a little bit more accessible for people to listen to the episodes as well. At this point, we also had really pivoted into becoming a podcast. Initially, Revision Path, like I said, was a magazine, or like an online magazine. But as I started doing these interviews, it became a lot easier to just record them as opposed to doing just these sort of like email interview kind of things. And I have to credit Raquel Rodriguez for giving me that idea. Raquel Rodriguez is episode one of Revision Path. And she was someone who had been reading Revision Path. She is a developer in Chicago, designer developer in Chicago. And she told me that she had been reading Revision Path and that she was coming down to Atlanta to visit and wanted to be on Revision Path, but she wanted to record something because she was a podcaster. She had a podcaster called, she had a podcast called, um, I forget what it's called, Queer and something in Chicago. I'm, I'm probably getting it completely wrong. I apologize about that. But she was the one that gave me the idea to record and from there to turn Revision Path into a podcast. So I absolutely credit her for giving me uh, the idea to do that because now we've managed to keep that going now for 400 episodes. This was also the year that we got our first sponsor, MailChimp, as a local email service provider company in Atlanta. This is also the year that I got an editor. This is my editor, RJ Basilio, who I shout out on pretty much every episode. We've been working together now for about six years or so. I also merged with another website. So the woman that you see here on the right, her name is Saida Mitchum. And Saida was doing a site called Inspiring Black Designers. That was very similar in scope to what I was doing with Revision Path. She saw the work that I was doing. She wanted to be a guest on the show. I said, absolutely. But before we decided to have her on the show, she talked about wanting to basically merge the work that we were doing together. Basically, she saw the scope that I had with doing Revision Path and felt like doing the work that she had done with her interviews would just be a good addition to that. So we ended up merging our sites in 2014. <clears throat> I also expanded and brought on some interns. As you see here from left, this is Eric, Rashida, and Stephanie. They were my first kind of cohort of interns that worked with me to help build Revision Path up. And in 2015 is when things really started to take an interesting turn not just with the vision path, but also just kind of with myself personally. So it's 2015, I've been doing my studio now for about seven years. 
and I still felt like I wanted to do another kind of creative project. Uh, revision Path was great, don't get me wrong. I love doing Revision Path, but I still wanted to do something else on the side that I felt would kind of scratch another creative itch that I had. I happen to be a really big fan of tea. Oh, a lot of my friends know that I like tea a lot. And so I thought, why don't I do something around, around that? So in 2015, I created the Year of Tea. And the Year of Tea was a daily podcast. This is before daily podcast really became a thing. But it's a daily podcast where I basically reviewed a different tea every day for an entire year. And what would be different about this is that the reviews would be like five minutes or less, about the time it would take you to brew a fresh cup of tea. Because a lot of tea media back then, and I would say a lot of tea media now, is pretty boring. It's poorly produced, it's long, and it doesn't really get to the point. And so I wanted to have something that would let you get to the point, let you know where you could buy the tea so you could move on with the rest of your day. And so this was my first foray not into just daily podcasting, but also into honestly like photography and staging and stuff like that. So I had bought myself a little light box and took these pictures with my phone at the time. So these are some of the teas that I would review on the show. I would also review bottle teas like kombucha or even like nest tea that you could get from your local corner store or something. What you see here on the left is a tocha, which is a fermented cake of tea called Pu'er. And then what you see here in the kettle is flowering tea. This is where artisans hand stitch together leaves and flowers into a bud that once you drop it into hot water will sink to the bottom and then blossom like a flower. So it's decorative, but it is also tea because you can, you can, drink, you can drink the water <laughs> essentially. And it ended up being a hit. A lot of companies discovered the work that I was doing really through no advertising whatsoever. I really was not advertising the show. I had it on uh, Apple Podcasts and on SoundCloud and such, but like companies found out about it and they just would send me tea to come on the show. As you can see here, this one tea came all the way from New Zealand that someone wanted to send, a Korean green tea from New Zealand. I had other companies that were reaching out and like, Again, sending tea, writing notes and things like that. I was surprised how many companies had really got behind this concept so easily. It had a lot of great reviews even in this kind of first year. And so it was something that was fun to do on the side while I was also doing Revision Path. With Revision Path, I had joined AIGA's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. And it was through them that I decided that I wanted to do a presentation about Revision Path and about Black design that really summed up a lot of the work that I was doing. And so I went to Southwest again in 2015, and I did a presentation called, Where Are the Black Designers? This presentation, I'm not going to lie, will come to haunt me for the next six or seven years, even to present day. But what Where Are the Black Designers was essentially me answering the question that so many companies and people were asking me once I started Revision Path. They were asking me, where are the Black designers? And I'm like, they're here. And what this presentation was doing is showing, basically, here are the reasons why there are not a lot of Black designers present in terms of socioeconomic reasons, school percentages, et cetera, but then also giving solutions on where you can find Black designers now, which were at meetup groups or online groups or things like that. So I wanted to give a solution and not just say, this is a problem. From there, a number of companies really took interest in Revision Path. Hover, Creative Markets, some creative companies, Jobwell, which is a kind of DNI hiring firm, Model View Culture, which was a um, kind of an online magazine and digest back then that was really popular in the tech industry. We got on Patreon and started soliciting patrons from the community that wanted to financially support what I was doing. We hit 100 episodes of the podcast. We got over $8,000 in donation via this group of techies called Fund Club that would pitch in $100. Every member would pitch in $100 for a particular cause for that month. And then depending on how much money they raised, they would then donate that to the group. So we ended up getting this huge financial infusion. We started getting support from the community. And Revision Path was really kind of starting to take off. This is also when I won the first award for the show. 
This is the Creative Market Awards in 2015, where we won most inspiring design podcast beating out 99% Invisible, Design Matters, Adventures in Design, a number of other super popular shows. 2016 kind of sees the continued rise of Revision Path. And from here, I kind of took that Where Are the Black Designers presentation and started to spread it out to other places. The first thing I did with that big infusion of money that we got was hire writers. And so as you can see here from left to right, we have Thelma, Vivi, AJ, Charlie, and Tammy. And these were sort of my first cohort of writers for the Revision Path blog. And what I wanted to do was have this blog that also would provide original written articles in conjunction with the weekly podcasts that were coming out. And so here's like some of the key art from some of these particular pieces. And what I wanted to do was basically make it like the anti ion design or the anti smashing magazine or something like that. And like really ask tough questions and also go into subjects that these sites would not delve into. Like using design for activism. This is also during the time when a lot of people were getting out onto the streets because of the extrajudicial killings of black and brown people across this country. We talked about whether black designers could afford to be weird. We talked about the lack of black glamor in merchandising. We talked about, we did a three-part series on tech in Africa, where we looked at it in the countries of Sudan, Algeria, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. I presented uh, my Where Are the Black Designers talk again at How Design Live, which took place in Atlanta that year. You can see it right there. And also what I noticed is that people were starting to do meetups around the show. This picture that you see here, this is from WordCamp. I think it was in Portland. And some of these people actually have been on the show. This is Kronda Adair. She had a site, I think she still has her company called Carvel Digital. She's been on the show. This is Lynn Muldrow, who has also been on the show. This is Jordan Green, who has also been on the show. He's also kind of an unofficial staff member of Revision Path. He helps out with some community stuff, or he had helped out with some community stuff when we did, when we did events back in the pre-pandemic times. And so I really started to think more about, okay, Revision Path is like tapping into a community. I don't know if it's necessarily a community around the show, but it's certainly a community of creatives that are using the show as like a nexus point to gather. And so one thing that I did was I created a Slack community at the time to kind of bring people together. In that Slack community, we would do these sort of monthly Ask Me Anything chats, AMAs, and bring in people to talk about all sorts of things from contract negotiations to digital entrepreneurship, anything like that. Also, a number of companies really wanted to advertise on Revision Path, like they had positions that they wanted other people to apply for. And so that's also when we opened up our job board, which ended up becoming a great source of revenue to keep Revision Path going. Basically a company could post on the board for 30 days for 99 bucks. And we shout it out on the podcast. And a lot of companies end up have, or still kind of end up using Revision Path as a way to see like, what's the next big talent that's out there that we need to get behind. We hit 150 episodes that year. We interviewed Ashley Axios, who at the time was the former creative director for the Obama White House. She's currently uh, residing in DC right now, but she was our 150th episode. This is also when we got our first really big sponsor in Facebook. Now, Facebook's kind of a controversial sponsor at the time. Certainly people knew about their issues with diversity and inclusion and a lot of people saw their initial sponsorship of Revision Path as kind of a way to sort of paper over that. But I've been fortunate to work with Facebook over a number of years. And even though Facebook now is kind of persona non grata or, or kind of taboo when it comes to the web and things like that, they've been an ardent supporter of the work that we've done, both financially, monetarily, as well as behind the scenes with connecting Revision Path to resources and things like that. I say all that to say Revision Path is not on Facebook, <laughs> but I appreciate that they still want to help out as we continue to do this. I even managed to speak at Facebook back in 2016, gave a talk called Black Design Matters. That's the poster. I don't know if, if you all can see the poster back there. I've got it 
on my bedroom wall as well, just to kind of remind myself that I spoke on Facebook one day. I also got to meet Mark Zuckerberg that day. He's shorter than you think. Oh, we also got a lot of shout outs from social media. This is Jonathan Jackson, one of the co-founders of We Should Do It All. This is Eddie Opara, who's a partner at Pentagram in New York City. We started creating merch. We did t-shirts, did mugs and things of that nature. We actually still have merch that's available. I kind of go back and forth on doing merch with Revision Path, but people bought it. So I figure why not keep doing it? We continue doing our Kwanzaa graphics, except we just upped the quality on them. This is 2016. So we have a kind of Olympics theme one here at Umoja, which means unity for Simone Biles, who back then clearly was like the star of Team USA. Kawumba for creativity, styled after a Prince album. Kujichagulia, which means self-determination, kind of did this like Trump, Hillary kind of thing. And then Imani, which means faith. This is based off of a Polaroid of Jean-Michel Basquiat, actually, not to, I think maybe like a couple of weeks or so before his death. And I shopped in Obama's image there because I thought that was a an interesting kind of thing. If you remember kind of what the political climate was back at that time, this was kind of a pretty powerful image. So 2017, Revision Pass starts getting noticed by Apple. We're part of their Black Experience collection. That's, that's me right there. We hit 200 episodes. Our 200th episode guest was Sarah Honey Young, who was a creative director, DJ, and photographer based out of Pittsburgh. And it's also when we started doing events. So we did our first live event in 2017 in conjunction with Facebook. We did a panel with Carla Cole, Tori Hargrove, Jill Nussbaum, and Ian Spalter. Carla currently now is working for the browser company. I think Tori and Jill are still at Facebook. Ian is the head of design over Instagram Japan. And Facebook came and they like swagged it out. They brought their own merch. This is everyone on the panel. I'm like off in the cut. You can't, I don't know why I'm not in this picture. Uh, this is the picture I took from the stage. So we had pretty good turnout. You can't really see, but they also, Facebook also catered the event. This is an event space near downtown where we ended up having it. It was pretty nice. We got more big corporate sponsors, SiteGround, the hosting company. Google signed on as a sponsor. Glitch signed on as a sponsor. And at the time, I only knew of Glitch because it was headed up by Neil Dash. But eventually, they ended up hiring me because of the work that I did on Revision Pass. So I actually did get a pretty sweet gig out of it, which was not a bad thing. That happened near the end of 2017. In 2018, Revision Path continues. I start getting recognized by Design Press. This is me in uh, Graphic Design USA. We start branching out to other platforms. This is the year we hit Spotify as well as iHeartRadio. We're part of Apple Podcast Black History Month collection. I do an exhibit of Revision Path remotely with the FHNW Academy of Art and Design Basel in Switzerland as part of their Swiss Design Network Summit, which is pretty cool. And also a little bit later on that year, um, I won the Stephen Heller Prize for Cultural Commentary for the work that I did on Revision Path. As you can read here on the side, it says, for being a Renaissance talent who works seamlessly across cultural domains, editorial lines, and multiple forms of media, for being the definitive leader in bringing Black designers to the public earning you a permanent place in the history of design equity and social justice, which is pretty dope. I was in New York for the event. This took place at, I think it was Cipriani's downtown. Got to wear a tux. It was great. I loved it. This is another event that I had won that year. It's a local, this is a local award here in Atlanta from our local alt weekly creative loafing. <clears throat> and it really meant a lot to me because the work that I do doesn't really tend to have a local appeal or influence. And so the fact that a local publication saw what I was doing here out of Atlanta and recognized me was really great, especially Creative Loafing, because if it weren't for them, I would not have gotten my first design job because I saw it in the back of their paper one day. We hit 250 episodes. Our guest that episode was Julian Alexander, who's the creative director of Slang Inc. 
I started doing more events, kind of singular events, not necessarily around the vision path. So we did a salon with AIGA DC, did some more work with AID, I'm sorry, with AIGA DC and their Emerge initiative. We partnered up with Adobe that year for World Interaction Design Day. I also branched out and brought on three more writers. This is Dwight, Katie, and Sella. Sella is also a guest on the, on Revision Path. I think she's episode like 166 or 168 or something like that. Really great interview. Suggest you check that out. And they also helped contribute a lot more pieces to the website as well. Some were more basic, like how to hire a designer or something like that. We did tributes to little known black figures in design. This is Dr. Samela Lewis was the first black woman to get a PhD in fine arts. We did an oral history of the organization of black designers, which is a design organization that at first was founded kind of an antithesis to AIGA, but has a storied history of really helping out black designers before revision path was started. So I was glad to kind of do an oral history of them and talk to past members and kind of get a sense of where the organization is. I was part of the Route 100 that year, which was really dope and unexpected. A couple of interesting things about this photo. I mentioned Stacey Abrams. She was also on the list that year. She's right there. And also, where is he? Fahamu Peku that you see right here. Dr. Fahamu Peku is a fine artist. He's also a guest on the show. I think he's like episode 254, 255, something like that. And right here, this person that you see here, this is Randall Woodfin. He is the mayor of Birmingham, Alabama. And Woodfin and I went to college together, like same freshman year. I knew him as a freshman. We hung out. I tutored him as well. So it was interesting to kind of see like people that I like actually know and have interacted with being a part of this. And like, I'm up here as well. Like I'm next to Party B. Like, what's that about? I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Later on that year, Revision Path became part of the Glitch Media Network. That was a licensing deal between myself and my employer to kind of help boost the work that Revision Path is doing. Ended up not being a good idea. Feel free to ask me questions about that, but so you live and you learn. So 2019 happens, we hit 300 episodes. We had Hannah Beekler, who was the award-winning production designer for Black Panther as our guest. We did a big event in New York City at the Green Space. We had Gail Anderson, Cat Small. Eddie O'Para was supposed to be there that night, but he got sick. But we had a really nice big event to celebrate 300 episodes, which was a, a wonderful event. And also a little bit later on that year, Revision Path became the first podcast to be included in the collection for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which was astonishing. Um, happy to answer questions about that because there's actually a whole other story behind how that ended up happening. We branched out onto Pandora as another platform, and I became a judge for the Webbies, which was really interesting. So I became a member of the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences for the work I've done with Revision Path. And they've got me here next to the co-creator of the internet, Vince Cerf. That's amazing. That's, that's I don't know. I, that's probably one of my biggest things that I'm the most geeked about is that I'm a member of the uh, IADAS. But, oh, wait, I don't know why that slides in there again. But, oh, yeah. Oh, that's why. Um, Coming off of the heels of winning this award in 2018, the Stephen Heller Prize for Cultural Commentary, I really wanted to do something around design writing. So Stephen Heller, for those of you who are designers that know, he's a very prolific author. He's written like 180 books or something like that. I wanted to do something in the spirit of that for Revision Path, essentially. So I created this digital design anthology called Recognize. And so for the first year we did it, the theme was space. We partnered with Envision as part of their Design Forward Fund and had funding to basically put out one anthology of the work. And so you've got six articles that are here. We have custom illustrations by Robert Lou Trujillo, which is a designer and illustrator that I know. And uh, this is sort of the first version of us trying to put this out into the world, which is really great. So 2020 happens and we're wrapping this up. I, I know we're a little bit over time, but hopefully we'll have time for questions after this. 
So 2020 happens and we're still keeping these live events going. The first thing that I wanted to do for 2020 was rebrand. So we kind of refreshed the logo. We refreshed the website a little bit with a new kind of typography treatment. And I started doing live events. So we did our first live event out in Los Angeles in February of 2020 with AIGA Los Angeles. And I interviewed a, a local black architect named Roland Wiley talking about gentrification in LA and a number of different things. And the goal was basically to do a tour across the United States. We were gonna do Los Angeles, Seattle, Houston, Little Rock, Chicago, Atlanta, DC, and New York. And then what happened after February? Coronavirus. So none of that happened. The whole tour got completely shut down. There was talk of doing virtual events, but I didn't really want to do virtual events because I think at that time, as most of us are, we were just trying to figure out what is this coronavirus and what's the next thing. Revision Path hits 350 episodes. Who did I have for episode 350? Kojo Boateng, who's the creative director at PBS NewsHour currently. That's who we have for episode 350. That's Kojo. Kojo also happens to be a good friend of Eddie Opara, who you saw in the earlier slide. And we did the second volume of Recognize that year. I kind of had to take a bit of a break because during the pandemic, I lost my job. And so with that, I also ended up losing funding and I lost the potential sponsor that we were going to have for the second year. So I had to take some time to kind of recoup. And eventually we ended up doing Recognize for 2019. I'm sorry, not for 2019, for 2020. The theme of it was fresh. And we managed to get, instead of publishing on Envision, we got the pieces republished on A List Apart, which is a well-known design publication. So now this year, 2021, 2021 has been an interesting year so far. I'm still kind of trying to find my footing now that it feels like we're coming out of this pandemic. Unfortunately, Recognize had to go. I had to shut Recognize down. The pandemic really kind of killed the momentum for the project. And as much as I still want it to continue and it may continue one day in some shape, form, or fashion. Eventually, uh, I ended up shutting it down. We did do an open call for submissions for three months. The theme of Recognize was uh, Reboot, but unfortunately, just the quality that we got in and the number was not enough to convince me to really do it for another year, and so we decided to kind of make the hard decision to shut it down for now. It may come back in the future, I don't want to say it'll come back next year, but it may come back in the future in some form. We hit 400 episodes as of this week. Our 400th episode guest is the prolific Brent Rollins. For those of you who may not know him, he's one of the co-founders of Ego Trip. If that doesn't sound familiar, I can tell you that he did the logo for Boys in the Hood. He did the logo for Poetic Justice. I think he also did the logo for Higher Learning. He did a lot of logos. For, oh, he did the logo also for Mo Better Blues. So he's, when you see some of those early black movie posters from Spike, Spike Lee, John Singleton, he's the guy behind them. And he did them when he was like a teenager. And so we got to talk about his whole design career. Definitely check out the episode if you haven't listened to it yet. So through all of that, what have I learned? A uh, couple of things. First, I think it's good to be a part of the solution and not just an observer of the problem. One sort of connecting thread between all of the projects that I've done is that I saw where something was wrong. There was a void or there was something that I thought was wrong. And I did something to be a part of the solution instead of just kind of carping about it on social media or whatever. I decided to kind of get out there and do something about it. I still think that's a good thing to do. Don't just rag rag about something that's wrong. Find a way to use your unique talents to try to be a part of fixing whatever that, that problem is. To that end, I would say that every absence is an opportunity. In each of the projects that I've done, I saw where there was a gap in programming or a gap in quality or something. And I felt like I can step in here and create something to fill that. And so this is something that really has been a, another kind of connecting thing between a lot of the projects that I've done. And also I would say the most powerful thing that you can be is patient. We live in a world certainly where everything is at our fingertips. We have high-speed internet. We've got 
these phones that are computers that can do so many things in the palm of our hands. But what I found for me is that the most powerful thing that I could do is just wait things out. For Revision Path, I could have done Revision Path in 2006. Would it have been to the quality that it is now? Maybe not. Would it have gotten the reach that it had gotten? Probably not. I waited like a good seven years until I had the idea for Revision Path to really have the time to flesh it out into something. And so I think it can be, you know, very easy to kind of rush into something, but also it's, you can't underestimate timing. And so I think I was really patient with most of the projects that I've done to know, okay, this is the right time to do something. And also this is the right time not to do something. So that is my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. And that is my time.